die, Father. There's nothing left. Ever since I was a child, I had the feeling that something is missing in me. I want to know why I am here. Can any of us know that? Become yourself. Then God and the devil don't matter. I want to learn. I want to understand. Be careful. Can you find the force to enable these two quite opposite lives to live together in your soul? At any moment, the wolf can devour the lamb. And you must learn what it means to become responsible. This is an exact science. And that is why you are here. Returning or new listeners, it doesn't matter. It's good to have you with us whenever or wherever you're listening from. My name is Henrik Palmgren from Sweden, and we have uh, two websites that I think you should check out if you want to hear more. RedEyesCreations.com and RedEyesMembers.com. Richard C. Hoagland is a former Museum Space Science Curator, a former NASA consultant, and was science advisor to Walter Cronkite and CBS News in the early 1970s. Hoagland proposed to Carl Sagan, along with Eric Burgess, the placement of a message to mankind aboard Pioneer 10. Since then, he has been pioneering the pursuit of uncovering the hidden data of our solar system. He is the author of several books, probably most famous for his theories on the face on Mars. His website, enterprisemission.com, is updated regularly with analytical research into current anomalies on our planet and way beyond. Today, Richard is with us to discuss the trip he did to Chichen Itza in the Yucatan, where he did torsion measurement readings with the Accutron device at the Temple of Kukul Khan on December 21st, 2012. In the first hour, Hoagland will set the stage and give us the details about the experience, consequent arrest and other strangeness. All right, welcome back to Red Ice Radio, Richard. Good to talk with you again. How are you? It's great to be back. I know you've been busy. Uh, a lot of things have been going on since we last talked, of course. I think one place where we need to begin is is around uh, your trip to uh, the pyramids down in uh, uh, Mexico and, and, and the whole uh, torsion. Uh, uh, I know that you were, you were arrested as well. Take, take this from the top for us, Richard, so we can, we can understand what happened to you here. Well, I've been working on the torsion field hyperdimensional model of, of a new physics, which actually is a rediscovered physics for about eight or nine years, ever since we made our first measurements of the Venus transit back at Coral Castle in 2004. And I was obviously beginning to empirically check the work that a lot of people had done vis-a-vis the Mayan calendar, the the predictions of the so-called end of the world. And we have been able to, with the assistance of Enterprise Mission Associates and uh, my Facebook friends and fans, of which there are legions, and I'm incredibly grateful to them, and to some private uh, sponsorship, we've been able to go to some very interesting places to ancient sacred sites all over the planet, Central America, Europe, etc., to measure the background torsion field changes uh, that were progressing in the model toward 2012, as well as the local amplification of the field that I, you know, basically had had laid out that these ancient sites might, in fact, create. And what we were doing, we sponsored people like NBC and, as I said, Enterprise Associates, is we went to Teotihuacan in uh, Mexico and to Tikal in Guatemala and to Stonehenge and Silbury Hill and Abury and some other places in England over the last few years, and we have measured 
in addition to background measurements here in the United States, we've been measuring this, the changes in this field with a device that I basically have adapted and digitized from my departed friend, Dr. Bruce De Palma, who first used it in the 1970s to measure this physics, except he didn't have any digital readouts. He didn't have laptop computers and apps and algorithms and, you know, the -the off-the-shelf stuff we have now. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is I've digitized the system so that you can basically take it anywhere. It runs on batteries. And you're looking at the background changes that are occasioned by time of day, where the moon is, where the sun is. I mean, this is all dependent, as we found out empirically, on celestial alignments, which, of course, is what the theory said it would be. And so we've been going from sacred site to sacred site measuring the changes in this field because the torsion field is is basically the old-fashioned classic ether that was supposedly abolished by the introduction of the theory of relativity by Einstein in the last century. Well, I can report that the ether is alive and well and doesn't know it's been abolished by anybody, (laughs) and we have been measuring it in these various places and getting rather extraordinary readings, which affirm again and again and again that the field strength and the changes in the field are dependent on celestial configurations, celestial alignments. In other words, we're looking, Henrik, at hyperdimensional astrology, nothing more, nothing less. So when the occasion presented itself, that was a long lead-in to answer your question, when the occasion presented itself to go to the Yucatan, to Chichen Itza, which is kind of like the Mayan center for all the ancient Mayan calendrical and ritual and memorial and ceremonial materials, uh, Robin and I jumped to the chance. And thereby, as they used to say, hangs a tail, because it turned out that for a variety of reasons, which I had described at some length on Coast the other night, um, certain permits were not secured by the organizers of the trip on which I was invited, unbeknownst to me. So the night before we get to Chichen Itza on the ship, I mean, we're on a 100,000-ton cruise ship called the Carnival Triumph. Now, if that name rings a bell, it's because that's the same ship, identical, the same ship that's been stranded in the Gulf of Mexico over the last week you know, when we when we record this, and just got into port last night, again, as we record this, with 5,000, I'm sorry, 4,000 passengers and crew <clears throat> without facilities, without anything. Huh. Something happened in the engine room, and I will speak to that later, okay. because my measurements may, in fact, give a hint as to what could have happened with this cruise ship, which was, you know, weeks later, weeks after we had actually used her to go to and from the uh, Yucatan. Well, anyway, we're on the ship the night before we get to Chichen Itza, which is December 18th. And we get a radiogram or a fax or a text or whatever they do on the high seas saying that under no circumstances will the authorities allow me to bring laptops, measuring equipment, the Accutron, backpacks, water, nothing into Chichen Itza. Wait a minute, back up. Who who sent the this message? This is from the authorities of Chichen Itza itself, the administration. So the, the the local government, basically. The local, well, yeah, well, you can call it the local government. I'm okay. not sure how it breaks down in terms of federal and local authority. I mean, we have measured other Mexican sites. I mm-hmm. mentioned Teotihuacan, yep. and we had no problems. So we were kind of thrown into a bit of a panic, so we called... Jaime Musa. Now, you, of course, have had Jaime on the show, right? Actually, I have not. We've tried to reach him. You need to help us get in touch with him, if oh. nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can we can certainly act as a go-between there. Thank you. Jaime is, is Mexico's probably preeminent authority on uh, UFO technology and apparitions and sure. sightings and yeah. research, as well as ancient archaeological research, particularly in my area. And he was incredibly valuable in Mexico City in 2009 in helping us gain access to Teotihuacan so we could carry out these measurements. So, of course, we call Jaime from the ship, which is not a simple thing, by the way, (laughs) either logistically or economically these days. You would think that you could call anybody from anywhere on the planet with satellites. 
not exactly true, and that's uh-huh. a whole other discussion. <laughs> anyway, so we eventually got hold of him, laid out you know, what I was trying to do as a culmination of eight, nine years of this research. I mean, without empirical research, Henrik, you got nothing. You may have a theory, you may have a nice idea, but unless you can measure it in science, it doesn't mean anything. Sure. The thing that's made our work so remarkable is that we put out a model for what should be going on. Then we actually went with, as I said, this digitized technology that I borrowed from my friend Dr. De Palma in the 1970s, and lo and behold, the predictions of the model are overwhelmingly confirmed. Mm. You know, the background torsion field is measurable, it's palpable, it's scientifically sensible in the, in the sense of being, you know, able to be sensed, it's measurable, it's reproducible, it's all the amazing things that, that bringing science into this equation would, would mandate if it was real. And now I was being told on the eve of going and, you know, making some preeminent measurements at the end of the Mayan calendar at the key Mayan site, Chichen Itza, I was being told under no circumstances are you going to be able to bring in any of this equipment. You can imagine how we felt. Yeah, definitely. Let me give you me your hunch here. What did you? How do you think that they found out? Uh, why was did they not want you to do this? What? what do you think? <laughs> well, we we can speculate, you know, till as I used to say over here, that the cows come home. Mm-hmm. But the the bottom line is, even the people from the ship who booked these these excursions, these shore excursions, as they're called, they tried to help. In addition to our own organizers of the so-called Grand Galactic. Mayan cruise of 2012, and the the head of the uh, of the shore expedition office came to me on the ship late on the evening of the 18th. She was actually crying. I mean, I was astonished to see someone who understood what was at stake, and she could do nothing with the authorities. <clears throat> Excuse me, they were they were absolutely implacable. They would not let me bring in the equipment that I had presumed had been okayed uh, before. So anyway, we're still on the night before. We're on the ship. We're we're headed at 20 plus knots toward, you know, Progresso, which is where you have to land and dock to disembark for a two-hour bus ride inland to Chichen Itza. And we called Jaime Musa. Well, Jaime's recommendation after we went through the whole thing was, "There's nothing I can do. It's too late. There's you know, there, we've had a new change of presidential administration in the last 20 days." This is Jaime's, you know, discussion with us. And the new government in Mexico is very strict and has changed all the rules, and I frankly don't quite understand what they're doing. This is what he was telling us. So his recommendation was you have to play ordinary tourists, you have to ditch the group, you have to go in by yourselves, just you and Robin, play tourist, you know, put the equipment in a in an old bag, you know, wear touristy type stuff that won't catch attention, you know, mm-hmm. and and basically try to slip in under the radar and get the measurements. Right. So this is what we did on the bus, which is a two hour bus ride from the ship to, to Chichen Itza, I used the PA system. We had an entire bus. We had something like fifty people who had signed up to help me carry out these measurements. It was it was quite extraordinary because we had a Mayan elder uh with with the group um, named Han Budsman, you may have heard of, mm-hmm. and he only had a hundred. So science had fifty percent on spiritualism, which the organizers of the of the tour were kind of amazed about. That people actually were interested in what we were trying to do, which I think is very affirming and very gratifying because we're putting science on these bones of mythology and you know new age woo woo and all that. We're actually able to measure what the Mayans were were intimately familiar with and left us in the form of a legacy of these extraordinary structures and what they do to the background trend uh, field, the torsion field of this of this entire planet. Again, per the actual measurements we've been able to carry out. So now we're on the bus, we're headed towards Chichen Itza, and I'm telling my 50 people, well, there's been a slight change plan. And so we described to them what had happened and politically uh, the situation we faced when we got there, and how they had to be our diversion. They had to lead authorities in another direction so that Robin and I could basically, 
you know, sneak in, although you can't really sneak in. You have to go through the turnstiles and, <laughs> you know, pay with your tickets and all that. Right. But by, by not being with a group and not being with the group they were expecting, I was hoping we would get an opportunity to carry out these extremely important measurements literally on the eve of the alignment, which everybody's been talking about for the last 10 or 20 years. Fast forward the film. We get to Gitanita after several stops, which is good because I was able to do background measurements and actually able to record and confirm that the field around Chichen Itza extends far beyond the actual government-defined limits of the perimeter of the fence. It is a regional thing. Whatever that pyramid or, or collection of pyramids and other structures are doing in the, in the, in the, in the force, to use a Star Wars term, <laughs> is measurable miles away from Chichen Itza itself. Now, I learned this when we were doing measurements in England a couple years ago because I had wanted to measure one particularly famous structure. And because of some reason, I, I think we had to get batteries or something, I stopped a half a mile away at a little store in the middle of nowhere in England to pick up some spare batteries. And I began measuring on a picnic table out in front of this little little store and half a mile away from the monument, the needle went off scale. Hmm. So I had realized from a couple of years ago that the way to measure these places is to sneak up on them. You do measurements far away, and you increase the frequency as you get closer because it, the, the effects are not confined just to the place that all the tourists are going. They cover a very large area, and they're interacting with the fields of other sacred sites that may not even be known. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's still buried, right? Sure, yeah. And that is torsion active. So what I was hoping to do is to create kind of like an area map, and lo and behold, sitting in a couple of parking lots, because what they do on these buses is they take you to all the concessionaires who are selling tourist stuff before you get to the, the grand complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so everybody has their hand in. I mean, it's really interesting to watch culturally how this is, parceled out between the tour guides and the ship and the tour company and the people who run Cheats and Eats. I mean, I couldn't believe the uh, commercialization uh, at Cheats and Eats where they have table after table after table oh, set yeah. up all over this complex of Indians and Mexicans and Spaniards and whoever <laughs> just selling stuff. I mean, it really, for me, it kind of took away from the sacredness of what the Maya obviously were trying to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it brought it into the, you know, late 20th, early 21st century commercialism where anything is, is uh, you know, open season to make a buck, <clears throat> or in this case, a, a Mexican, you know, e equivalent dollar. Anyway, so we get to the complex, finally, and I've gotten some very interesting readings leading up to actually getting there. And we put all our stuff in it, a, a canvas bag and cover it with water, <clears throat> water bottles and tourist pamphlets and you know, we're wearing hats and, you know, <clears throat> short-sleeved, you know, Hawaiian shirts and looking as ugly American touristy as possible. <laughs> and we get to the turnstiles. And the guide who takes uh, your ticket looks down and he says, laptop? And I think, oh, God, here we are. And, I mean, what, what can I do? Can I say, no, it's not a laptop? It's a water bottle? It looks like a laptop? No, I said, yeah, laptop. He says, Okay and waved us through. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, and Robin's thinking, we made it. Somehow we got in, you know, Jaime's advice was great. We got it under the radar. So I make a beeline, <clears throat> which is like 1,400 feet away, down this path covered with, you know, vines and palms and lined on both sides by vendors, hawking everything imaginable. I mean, it was incredibly vibrant because all the bright colors, reds and blues and yellows and greens and tables with all kinds of carved wares and stoneware and wooden idols and wooden, you know, effigies and all this. Mm -hmm. Before you even get near the, the pyramid, you've got to go through, you know, an eighth of a mile of this stuff. So we're walking briskly with our canvas bag, with the instrumentation toward the pyramid, get out of this cope of trees and the path and the vendors 
and get a chance to look across this open plaza to see the pyramid, and it's astonishing. It, it's it, that that first impression is really incredibly impressive, and so everybody has to go and do this because what happened to me will not happen to you unless you take in forbidden instrumentation. So I make a beeline for the far side of the pyramid, which is the north eastern side, which is one of the two sides where you have the stairway that is is architecturally created in such a way that at the equinoxes you see a snake-like uh, shadow form shimmering up and down the stairways depending upon whether you're looking at dawn or, or sunset. Right, yeah. It, it, it's, very, it's, quite, it's known all over the world. This pyramid is known for that. I figured that that was the side that was active if the masonry was designed to follow the seasonal alignments. Because, again, we know the physics is based now on celestial alignments, and the solstice and the equinox are two celestial alignments, right, mm -hmm. with the sun. Mm -hmm. So I get to the base of the stairway on that side, and it's just after um, uh, 1130 in the morning. It's still not even noon. We have to leave by 1 o'clock to drive two hours back to get, get the ship. You know, this is not an easy expedition, and I now know next time we don't do it this way because you're constrained by schedules of technology and transportation that don't really allow, you know, good science. But, yeah, you know, it's yeah. the first time for everything. <laughs> so there we are. I'm at the base of the stairway of the Kukla Khan Pyramid. I'm pulling out the gear. I'm setting it up, and I find I can't see a thing. The sunlight is so bright and dazzling, you know, because you're, what, 20 degrees north, and it's uh, in, in winter, so the sun is south, and it basically, you know, is, is uh, it's, it's like high noon. Mm -hmm. And the ground is very bright, and it's there's no grass. There's lots of tourists, a lot of them dressed in white, because they're going to be part of Hanbudsman ceremony. But I find that I cannot see the laptop screen, which has been darkened, because the only way you can function when you do these measurements is on batteries. So you, you have to dim it down and to save the Yeah, exactly. Battery. You have yeah, to try to sure. save power yeah. so that you get measurements for as long as possible. Ah. And I had two sets of batteries, so I could go like 10 hours. But when you switch in the middle, if something interesting is going on and you switch, you obviously are going to lose that data. Yeah. So yeah. I was trying to do everything to save power. Well, I found that dimming the screen to the degree that I had before we got there meant that I couldn't see anything. So I look <laughs> around quickly, and I notice that over between a, a, a place called the um, um, Platform of Venus, which is to the northeast, and another area, which is a absolutely onslaught of, of man-made artificial tree trunks, which is a temple whose name escapes me at the moment, which is more to the southeast, there is a cope of trees, lots of trees, with benches under them, and shade. Is this the called the uh, the Temple of a Thousand Warriors? Is that what you're yes, talking about? Yes, yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. Yep. Yeah, that's to the south of the platform of Venus. Right, yeah. So I make a beeline between these two other structures, because we're only going to be a few feet away, maybe, you know, 300 feet, 200 feet, less than a football field, away from the pyramid. And again, what I found at Teotihuacan and found at Tikal, and found on the way to Chichen Itza, is that the influence, the torsion field influence of these structures is so vast and so amazing that you don't have to be right on them. One of the things that had changed since people had actually visited this pyramid in 2007, when you used to be able to run up and down the stairs, and I had hoped that we'd actually be able to conduct measurements on the pyramid like I had done at some of the other places in Central America. No, they've closed it off now, so you can't walk up and down the stairs. Uh. You have to be in the vicinity, but the good news is that's as good as being on the pyramid because these things have huge influence over a very large volume slash area. So there I am with Robin you know, behind me and, and uh, Ted St. Rain, who is taking video of all of this to document you know, what we're doing, by ourselves, playing tourist taking a laptop and the Accutron and the quartz crystal reference and the other instrumentation that is required to do these measurements scientifically, and I'm heading towards some trees which are to the east of the pyramid in an effort to, actually northeast, in an effort to get out of the sun 
so I can see the screen and complete the setup. Right. So I get there, sit down, take out the equipment again, which I haven't actually put away. It's been all carried on the laptop. Make the final adjustments, start doing measurements, and suddenly, over my left shoulder, I hear in half English and half Spanish a voice say, you can't do that. Hmm. What? I look up, and there's a federale with cap and uniform and walkie-talkie sternly looking at me, looking at the pyramid, and making me feel that I had just somehow committed a major felony <laughs> in, in the state of U the Yucatan in Mexico. All right. <laughs> so Robin and I engage him in conversation. Ted St. Rain is filming, and we're going back and forth, and he's telling me that he's been on the walkie-talkie to the administration building, which is he points back across the pyramid just the way we came. And I have to get up and I have to leave and I have to take my equipment and I have to go and meet with the head administrator. So I say, of course, delaying, delaying, well, why can't he come here? Oh, no, 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 you have to go, you know. So this goes back and forth for agonizingly long minutes <laughs> as I'm trying to stretch all this out to get some kind of readings. Because I know that if we get readings, I will have a baseline from which to measure the other materials that we gathered on the way in, those, you know, a couple, three stops on the way in, and then to compare to the other measurements we had done at Teotihuacan and Tikal and the other Mayan sites that we've been able to measure. Yeah, and so Rich Richard as well, was this done time sensitive? Did you try to make the 11, uh, 12, 11, 11 a.m. Uh, time as well here? Actually, well, because we're on, we're on um, standard time, we we're off daylight, we got there, I was able to start measuring exactly at noon. Okay, yeah. So, you know, and that's what we found. <clears throat> Some interesting things happened at Teotihuacan. So I was able to make, because these things are not to the second, they're, they're windows. It's like plus or minus five minutes or ten minutes or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we're recording beginning at noon. And we've got until like at about one o'clock, i got an hour of measurements if nobody interferes with me. And this guy, you know, official, is obviously interfering. Well, I'm thinking, okay, the longer I can constrain him and draw this out, so we, you know, do every dumb tourist thing you can think of, you know. Um, do you speak English? Oh, I don't understand that. Oh, you know, we've got the, the, the people of the turnstiles, they waved us through. You know, what's the big deal about a laptop? Because it was the laptop that obviously they were looking for. Mm -hmm. And there are people all over with cell phones. And they're using them and trying to find bars and you know what purists usually do these days, which is to go to a sacred place and then try to call home and say, Hey, Ma, you'll never guess where I'm standing. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> right. But it was a laptop, which apparently rang this guy's alarm bell. Mm. So I'm delaying and delaying and delaying, and finally he's getting healthier and healthier, and he's making calls on the walkie-talkie. And, at, you know, I'm, I'm envisioning, <clears throat> while all this is going on, <laughs> Excuse me. I'm envisioning that I actually will be physically incarcerated and placed in confinement if I don't follow this guy's injunction eventually. Mm. Because there had been a Marine, remember the Marine, the story of the Marine, the U.S. Marine, who had gone to Mexico <clears throat> just a few days before this and who had been arrested and put in a Mexican jail for bringing in a shotgun mm. to go hunting that was, uh, I guess, a half-inch shorter than the permissible uh, legal limit in Mexico. <laughs> okay. Huh. And this is after he had checked with the embassy and he filled out the paperwork, and as soon as he brought in the shotgun, bingo, they arrest him. Jeez. Okay. And at the time we were there, he was still incarcerated. And, of course, you all heard the stories about Mexican prisons. Right. It's you, a, you don't a really want to spend your end of the Mayan calendar in a Mexican prison. Well, this is all... <laughs> You know, going past my mind's eye as I'm trying to delay bureaucratically this guy from physically arresting. Now, when we got back to shore, and I told the story in part on Coast the other night, someone kindly sent me a clipping email attachment from uh, uh, Thomas's uh, law books, which is a series of law books that are used even by the Supreme Court in terms of precedent. And they have, oh, I forget what page it's on, but they have an actual definition of arrest. And let me let me pull it up here on the computer, 
and read to you what it says because it's very, very um, eye-opening when it comes to to uh, this is from excuse me American Jurisprudence Second Edition Volume Five printed in two thousand seven by Wes Thompson he's the author and it says arrest page nine uh, six nine five. An arrest is the exercise of the power of the state to deprive a person of his or her liberty. An arrest is the most intrusive police citizen encounter. Mm. What constitutes an arrest? Generally, an arrest is the quintessential seizure of a person. An arrest is the taking, seizing, or detaining of the person by another. One, by touching or putting hands on the arrestee. Two, by an act that indicates the intention to take the arrestee into custody and that subjects the arrestee to the actual control and will of the person making the arrest. In other words, this guy is telling me that unless I do what he says, he's going to take further action. That is an arrest. Mm -hmm. So there are people who will say, well, you weren't thrown in jail. They didn't throw away the key. You weren't... No. The technical definition of arrest is what you undergo when someone curtails your liberty and makes you do what they want as opposed to what you want. Mm -hmm. yep. So we got to... I mean, this is all on video. I mean, you can actually see him getting hotter and hotter and more adamant and making several calls on the walkie-talkie. Finally, he dramatically points toward the administration building with its thin radio antenna sticking up um, and looking at, at me and looking at the laptop, and he says, you have to go to the administration building now. Mm. So I realized the game is up. I mean, we've been able to dally around for like 10, 12 minutes, something like that. So I start off with Robin behind me carrying the, the, uh, bo the bag with the water bottles, which are heavy, poor, poor gal, and I'm carrying the laptop, and I've got the Accutron in my pocket, and I've got the Quartz Crystal Reference in one hand, and I've got wires trailing me, and I'm moving as slowly as possible. So as I cut back across this, this, this uh, plaza with the pyramid sitting in the middle, we'll cut right past the northeast corner, and I'll get a, a cut, a baseline from the trees, cross toward the pyramid, and then out toward the administration building, and this will all show up in, in, the, in the recordings. And my plan is, when we get to the corner of the pyramid, I'm saying to Robin and Ted, is he behind us? Is he still looking? Is he watching? You know, and they're saying, no, no, he's, he's, he's you know, working with some other tourists. You know, apparently they had, I don't know, the wrong kind of water bottle or something. <laughs> um, I'm figuring we'll get to the pyramid, I'll make a left-hand turn, and I'll be out of line of sight of this guy, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll be able to continue the measurements. I'll walk around on the other side, and I'll find another group of trees to hide in, and I'll try to maybe put the laptop under the bag or something, and we'll just wait out this, this, this time till we get back to the ship out of sight, because how are they going to find two people in the midst of thousands? There were thousands there that day. Yeah. You know, tourists and members of groups, and our we had remember our two groups and my guys doing their their diversion tactic, <laughs> which uh, basically amounted to standing on sides of the pyramid and clapping and listening for the echoes. <laughs> that's, that, that's one of the things that you do when you're a Tsitsa Nitsa. Uh, okay. <clears throat> and it turns out there are seven echoes. Now that's oh. important because in the physics. The tetrahedral symmetry underlying the physics itself is a seven symmetry spin. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the Maya built their complex so you can get seven echoes is kind of interesting. Okay, hmm. it's not the only piece of evidence or clue they left us that they knew what we know, but it's certainly some of the most dramatic. And our group was determinedly doing their echoey thing to keep the attention of the authorities on them to give us time to do the measurements, mm -hmm. not yep. knowing I had been arrested. <laughs> so we're heading toward the corner of the pyramid, and I'm saying to Robin, is he looking, is he looking, is he behind us? He didn't follow us. He just stayed there under the trees and, as I said, turned his attention to some other poor sucker that he had to badger. 
We get to the corner of the pyramid. I'm about to make the left-hand turn, and there's another guard. Ah, oh, bummer. With a walkie-talkie. Mm -hmm. And she looks kind of nice. She's short, but she's nice. She had been designated to pick us up and personally convey us to the administration center. If you doubt, I was arrested under the, the definition of American jurisprudence. This should leave no doubt in anyone's mind. I was not going to be able to make my little, you know, do -si do left-hand turn and disappear in the crowd. Yep. So we're walking slowly. We're walking. You know, remember the museum thing? We're walking. We're walking. And I'm trying to get measurements, and we walk all the way, escorted by this young lady with her walkie-talkie on the air to the administration. I mean, you'd think I had committed some staggeringly abominable federal Mexican crime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All I'm doing is carrying an open laptop. What's the big deal? Yeah, what's the big deal, exactly. <clears throat> so we finally get, we walked back down this, this esplanade of vendors under the curving trees with their trinkets and their idols and their wood carvings and desperately trying to make a buck off the tourists. I mean, you really have to feel for the economy of Mexico that, that they have to profane a sacred site this way. It really was kind of tragic to see. So we get to the turnstiles, go back through them, <clears throat> and I'm standing under a portrait with pillars, uh, and you can see all this on the satellite imagery, which I'm putting together as part of the presentation of what the data actually showed us. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing there in front of the administration building, and my, my, my second guard says, stand here, wait. And there's a sign on the administration building saying, closed. Oh, great. So I start to go into this closed office and meet with this guy um, at their discretion, but guess what? The computer and the Acatron are still recording. Mm -hmm. And because it's shaded under this, this overhang, I'm able to see on the screen we're getting really interesting data. So we do another, you know, draw the time out. So I stand out there obediently. You know, I, I find that there's, a, there's a, one of those plastic garbage cans that has the the kind of top on it where you put things in through the side. So I'm able to put the laptop and the Accutron down on this garbage can, standing out in front of this brilliant orange pillar, one of a dozen or so, in front of the administration offices in the shade next to an open courtyard. I'm 1,400 feet from the pyramid, and I'm still getting really interesting readings. So... Robin and our Mayan guides who were with us on the bus, they eventually get tired of standing there because nobody came out. Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. This gal disappears into this building and never emerges, never comes out, never comes back. So I'm standing there, and obviously the game is they think if they get Hoagland away from Pyramid, Hoagland's measurements come to an end. They'll just keep him cooling his heels out in front of this administration building until the bus has to leave, problem solved, right? Technically, I'm still under arrest. Technically, I have been told, stand here and wait. Another official, another authority will be coming to interview you, to talk to you. Mm. Nothing ever happens. So Robin, you know Spanish, goes in and tries to talk to this guy. He doesn't want to come out and talk to me. He doesn't, this is curious, he doesn't want me to come in and talk to him. Okay. He wants me to be standing out there, in essence, in their view, doing nothing, okay. cooling my heels until the bus has to leave. Hmm. Not knowing, because obviously the underlings don't know, anything about how the physics of this extraordinary place is really working. That I'm getting really interesting data. And we didn't know how interesting until we got back to the ship and started you know, looking at it the, the, that night and the next morning and realized that we'd gotten a real treasure trove right under these guys' noses, despite their best efforts to stop it. I mean, if they had taken my equipment, that would have been one thing, but they basically thought if they got me away from the pyramid, uh, they would have done their duty. Now, remember, this is going on with the clock ticking. 
because the bus is going to leave in about an hour, actually less than an hour now, about 45 minutes, and that will be the end of what I can do on, on the on the campus of Chichen Itza. So Robin is talking to this guy, and my Mayan guy is talking to him, and they come out several times, and I'm, I'm making the usual, well, we didn't know that there were fees for for permits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, playing real dumb tourist, right? right? Whatever we have to pay, of course we'll pay. You know, I'm thinking, you know, what they'll do is they'll <clears throat> give me an extraordinary amount. Uh, some of it will go into somebody's pocket, right? Yep. And that's the way the system works. Oh, no. This is not your normal touristy situation. They do not want me with that laptop anywhere near in their mind the pyramid from which I will gather data that for some reason they don't want the world to know about. But they don't know the limits or extent of what this thing is doing, so they think if they get me away from it, standing there cooling my heels, nothing can happen, right? Who's giving the instruction, do you think, to to keep you away? Well, I think it's because we made a big deal um, the night before ship to shore, with the authorities, the ship did, you know, uh, Carnival Cruise Lines did, because they get a piece of the action of the um, override on the tourist, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we think they may have mentioned Jaime's name. Hmm. And the fact that he was involved kicked this up to a federal level. And I think they definitely had somebody on the lookout for a guy with a laptop. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, again, you've got thousands of people it's the night before, the night before, the afternoon, the afternoon before, the end of the Mayan calendar, the 13th Bok Tune. You've got people with cell phones and iPads and iPhones and every conceivable form of electronics, including a zillion cameras, right? The only guy they arrest is the guy with the laptop. Now, that has to tell you something. In fact, I, I found out some more data because we had been told that this huge crackdown on what you could bring in was all because they were concerned on the eve of the end of the calendar. Here's the here's the term that's floated all over the world. They were concerned with terrorists. Okay. Terrorism. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a you know older guy with a with a you know. You got a, a bomb in your laptop. Straw right. hat. Got it. Going to bomb the Chichen Itza complex <laughs> with a laptop. <laughs> so I'm standing there, and Robin makes a great you know pretense you know of getting mad at me in public and, oh, you can stand there. I'm going to go. and So she leaves me to stand there with the system still working. And she takes Ted and she takes our Mayan guide and disappears back down the 1,400-foot path toward the pyramid and toward the complex. So, you know, she obviously can see something as well as give me time to stand there and continue to take measurements, which no one seems to notice. And I'm standing there, and I'm looking at the tourists, you know, going past me, and their lines passing, you know, in front of me, going through the turnstiles to get into the, you know, campus so they can go and see the wonders and the sights and all the vendors. And I'm watching the office, which is, you know, what, 15 feet away across this this little uh, passageway underneath, protected from the sun, the concrete, you know, overhang. And there's nothing going on in this administrative office some people go in, some people go out, they look like they're official. I see one guy, you know, with a silver hair and a silver mustache who looks kind of like he would be an administrator, and I try to catch his eye and see if he's looking for me. Nothing, nothing. He's, you know, he talks with a beautiful young guide. They kind of walk off together toward the parking lot, and you can finish the rest of that story in your mind. Anyway, so there I am, all by my splendid lonesome, taking measurements, ostensibly outside Chichen Itza, but close enough that we're getting all kinds of readings being totally ignored, but kind of under house arrest. Mm. So after about 15, 20 minutes of this, I look around, and I realize that if I, if I move my equipment a few feet, like 15 feet in the other direction, out into this open, sunny courtyard, which has concrete spars across the top, so there's kind of like a, late, a lattice-like effect in the shadows on the on the floor of this of this patio. I can put the Accutron next to a a wall of the structure to see if it will have any change 
in terms of the amplifying of the background field, which is one of the things I learned in doing this before at other places. Right, because at this point you don't know whether you will you will get different results moving around uh, the exactly. complex. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You got it right on the head. So I figure that technically I'm still kind of standing in front of the administration building where I was told to stand. But if they come out and say, what are you doing? I'll say, well, I wanted to move here because the sun you know, was coming around and I was getting too hot, something like that. <laughs> so I moved over there by the wall near a staircase, set up the equipment, and start taking readings in a new location about 15 feet from where I'd been standing with the equipment sitting on the top of this garbage can. And then I look around and I realize that in the center of this little plaza, which is maybe 30 feet across, 40 feet, something like that, there's a coffee bar, an open coffee bar, and I can get something cold to drink because it's getting very warm. So I leave the equipment, I leave the laptop and the equipment by the wall and this staircase that led up to a second story, all in brilliant white stone. You have to imagine it's sun-drenched, it's very bright, it's sunny, it's noon, Mexico in, in the Yucatan. Um, gorgeous day, by the way. Mm -hmm. Fluffy clouds, blue sky, white clouds, tons of tourists, everybody enjoying being at Chichen Itza, except me. <laughs> <laughs> so I go over to the coffee bar, leave the laptop and the equipment doing its measuring a few feet away, keep my eye on it, go over, get something nice and cold, go back, and I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And finally, it gets to be about 1 o'clock, And we had been told that one o'clock we had to go back to the parking lot, which is another couple hundred feet further from the pyramid, to get back to the buses so we could get on board and get home to the ship in time so they wouldn't sail without us. You know, you're kind of constrained when you do these things as part of a group. Sure, yeah. So I pick up my equipment, and I continue doing measurements all the way out into the parking lot. I rendezvous with Ted and with Robin and the other members of our group, and I'm sitting there while we're waiting for the everybody to kind of dribble back and then board the buses, and I'm trying to take more measurements, more measurements. We get on the bus. We're about to leave. I look down, and I realize, oh, my gosh, I've left the bag. Remember the canvas bag with the water bottles and the pamphlets and mm -hmm. all the touristy stuff? Yeah. I, when I moved the equipment from the garbage can over by the wall in front of the administration building, I left the canvas bag with not only water bottles and stuff, but my passport oh. sitting by that garbage can in front of the administration building. Well, that's no good. Not at all. So Robin, of course, you know, yeek, and she and you know, Ted says, well, I'll, I'll, I'll help run and find it still there. So they run, literally run, down the corridor. Fortunately, you don't have to get into the complex because it's on the other side of the turnstiles. It's before you get into Chichen Itza itself. They run down, and lo and behold, the bag is still there. And they pick it up, and they run back to the bus, and I've got my passport and all that. And then I began to realize something very weird. Because I had seen, I remembered seeing while I'm standing there in this in this courtyard now, farther away from the administration building, by the laptop as it's doing its measurements by the wall, I remember seeing a couple of janitors. You know how you know janitors on a, on a, on a, on a tourist complex? They're the ones wearing the orange um, vests. Mm -hmm. And they have brooms. And they have things with wheels. They've been picking up trash all over the the area they've been assigned, and they wound up dumping it into this trash can, the one that I had the equipment sitting on sure, just yeah. minutes before. Yeah. Well, while they're doing that, unbeknownst to me in my memory, the green canvas bag with the water bottles and the tourist pamphlets and my passport is sitting right in front of them at the base of the trash can they're emptying their trash into. And they don't do a thing. Now, you've been in the United States long enough, Henrik, to know that you cannot leave a bag unattended in a major airport without calling down, you know, the Hades of hell. Sure. Yep. That every, every possible security guy is going to run guns drawn to the <laughs> site of an abandoned bag 
because obviously it's from some terrorist, some bomber sure. who has <laughs> left it ticking and has escaped from the scene and it's going to blow up and kill an awful lot of people. If there was a real security lockdown on Chichen Itza that afternoon, how come the janitors, who are the people wandering around cleaning up and looking for junk, for debris, for trash, how come they had not been briefed? Oh, and if you find an abandoned canvas bag, you know, sound the alarm because obviously this is a terrorist. Mm -hmm. yep. And at the very least, taking the bag. I mean, it's sitting right in front of the administration building, for God's sake. If I had been a terrorist, could you think of a cleverer way to cause mayhem and destruction? Probably not. And yet they left it there for another 45 minutes so Robin and Ted could go back and pick it up and return to the parking lot and the buses, and we started back to the ship. Sure, yeah. So obviously the whole story, the whole, you know, fake innuendo about terrorism and terrorists and you can't bring anything in was all a shaggy dog story. Oh, of course, it always is. We know that. Well, but it's nice to have confirmation. <laughs> and in this case, it's absolute confirmation. They had not briefed any of their personnel no. to be on the lookout for terrible people doing terrible things. Sure. They were on the lookout for a guy with a laptop conducting illicit measurements <laughs> on something they don't want known. Yeah. Wow. You know, Richard, we're, go we're going to take a break here in a, in a minute or so. We're going to, of course, carry on talking more in the second segment. I want to let you continue your story and obviously, uh, you know, just carry on and, and see where this is going, of course. I want to ask you more about the... Uh, well, what it is you measure and, and, and how that works, the Accutron, the torsion measuring instrument and all that. But uh, is there anywhere, you, sa you said you recorded videos and stuff for this. Uh, so is this going to be up on the web somewhere later on your website or, or something like that? So people I can find out. I, I'm not sure, but I think Ted has actually posted this section, Hoagland Gets Arrested, on YouTube somewhere. Oh, okay. i got to see that. <laughs> oh, you've got to see this because it's, it's, it, it, it's a real-time slow-motion De depiction of a process that totally bureaucratic, totally unthinking, totally on automatic pilot, and nobody really cared about the thing everybody said they cared about, mm. which was keeping terrorists from doing terrible things to all the tourists at Chichen Itza. Sure, yeah. I mean, that was an inadvertent part of the experiment. The, uh, the fact that I did not remember, because the bag was sitting on the other side of this pillar and this uh, trash can, from my new position by the wall doing the measurements. I had forgotten, because I'm trying to make sure that I get the instrumentation with me and no one walks off with it, I had literally forgotten that I had a canvas bag that I'd been carrying this stuff in. Because once you get to a site, as you'll see when you see the um, sci-fi special, the, the New Secrets of 2012, which was taped in 2009 and aired on sci-fi dozens and dozens of times, I am carrying this open equipment, and it's kind of delicate, and it has to be balanced properly, and I obviously don't want to drop it, and I don't want to, you know, step off a pyramid in the wrong direction and wind up sailing through hundreds of feet of empty space. So I was really focused on the equipment and totally, you know, forgot the bag. That bag was there consistently from the time that I was told to stand in that particular place till the time Robin and Ted came back from the bus to get it. Nobody gave a damn of an abandoned bag sitting right in front of the administration building. Within feet. I mean, if I had had C4 or something in that bag, it would have totally destroyed the central administrative complex of Chichen Itza, taken out hundreds of tourists standing in line waiting to get in. I mean, it would have been the perfect place to carry out a terrorism act, and nobody gave a damn. Mm which is absolute proof that this whole war on terrorism, at least in terms of that particular set of pronouncements and edicts, was a total fake. Sure, yeah. They did not want anyone coming in with equipment, scientific equipment, to measure what was going on at Chichen Itza. Now, have you been, you know, I, I, I sent you some links to look at before we, we agreed to do this. Yes. Did you happen to see 
the double picture I sent of Chichen Itza on a tourist photograph taken in the summer of 2009. Oh, definitely. We we had that one up on the website ourselves. Ah, extraordinary. So yeah. you've got the before and after where the tourist with his iPhone takes a picture on an mm-hmm. afternoon during a thunderstorm from the ball court looking across the wall toward the Kukulkan Pyramid. Yeah. And it's sitting there in all its splendor under a glowering thunderhead which is looming up over it, kind of a darkened, you know, storm-wracked sky, very dramatic. But it's just a pyramid. In the next shot, he's got his two little daughters in the shot in front of the wall in the ball court with the Kukulkan Pyramid beyond. And everything is the same except there is this incredible parallel vertical pink beam. Yes, a pink beam shooting skyward from the center of the pyramid up into those clouds that is mind-boggling. Now, you'd look at that, which I did originally when I got it a couple, three years ago, and you say, that's got to be a hoax, it's fake. You know, somebody in Photoshop. Mm. Not. For one thing, I got the original images from Jaime back when we were doing our torsion work in 2009. This had come into him from some tourist who visited Mexico and had taken this shot, and he got a copy. Later, Linda Moulton Howe, I presume you've had her on your show. Sure, yep. Okay, Linda did an incredible due diligence, everything a Sterling reporter should do. She actually tracked down the tourist and the family that took the pictures. And she had a whole report on earthfiles.com describing where they came from. I think they came from Honduras, you know, where they'd stayed, the buses they were on, the group they were with, how the pictures came to be. It turns out that he just took them on an iPhone when he was trying to photograph his daughters, and when they got back on the bus and he looked at the pictures, you know how tourists will share pictures? Sure, yeah. Everybody was looking at these pictures he had just shot moments before in the ball court. So there was no way. I mean, you really have to be incredibly uh, cynical and skeptical to think that this average Honduran tourist with his two little girls had cleverly figured out a way to hoax a, an iPhone uh, image taken in front of the pyramids in July of 2009 showing a beam shooting up into space from the pyramid. You know, Occam's Razor says, no, the photographs are real, the family is real, the tourists are real, the people on the bus who saw the, the image in real time were real, and this really happened. Yeah, as far as I know, Richard, no one has actually been able to... Uh to prove that it's a it's a fake, uh, as you said, Jamie Musan has done a pretty good analysis of the picture and, and looked at it in different ways and stuff like that. So it seems to be the the, the real deal, as far it's as I know. It's a real anyway. deal, and what's really cool is when I got back and had peace and quiet to analyze our data post Chichenitsa, I was able to turn the clock back in the celestial simulation programs we use, mm-hmm. like Redshift and um, Celestial and all that. I now know in the physics why that beam was triggered at that particular time on that afternoon of July 24th, 2009. Interesting, okay. It has to do with celestial alignments, and that's part of the presentation of data I'm preparing when we can present this, because, you know, kind of fast forward the film, I was supposed to come back from the cruise, and then this month, last weekend in February, I was to present our first cut of data at the uh, Conscious Life Expo in Los Angeles, which is organized by the same folks who organized the the Mayan Galactic Cruise, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't happen because they suddenly uninvited me. Okay. Mm -hmm. They did not want me to present what I found. Now, I'm not sure exactly what happened. I do know that Ted St. Rain, remember our videographer, mm-hmm. who in fact was the videographer for the entire Mayan Galactic Cruise, he told me afterwards that the last night on the ship, when we were doing kind of a plenary session, everybody was kind of talking with everybody else as to what they had learned and what they found and what the experience meant to them, and I laid out some preliminary data that we'd recorded at Chichen Itza, Ted and several other people said that there were two Mexican federales wearing federale caps 
up in the back of the auditorium with video camera filming everything I presented. Hmm. Now that means that the Mexican government paid Carnival Cruise Lines for two tickets for two people to get on that ship at Progreso or maybe Cozumel, where, where, which was our, our last stop in Mexico before we uh, uh, you know, came back to the States. Mm-hmm. And they paid them to basically go on the ship and film me presenting the data we had recorded. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. No, Richard, before Isn't we carry on here, before we carry on, let, let's take a short break. I want to continue uh, and, and let you uh, fold out the story, if you will, and, and all the intricacies uh, thereof. In the meantime, of course, just uh, be- quickly before we take a break, we want to relay people to enterprisemission.com. That's the website where you can uh, read more about all this stuff and you can take a look at the photos that Richard talked about, about the, this beam coming out and everything. We'll link that up. And, of course, uh, we're going to look around and see if we can find that YouTube video as well so you can t- take a look at the <laughs> experience yourself. But uh, Anything else, by the way, Richard, we should give out website-wise or something like that before we take a short break here. Well, don't forget our two Facebook pages. I have a fans and friends page. There are close to 50,000 fans and friends, and I want to thank all of them for their support. And if you want to join our merry band, there will be more adventures because we're going to be doing more of this, hopefully avoiding arrest. So, um, And when we come back, I'll tell you, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. That sounds very good. Stay with us, uh, Richard. And again, all the links will be up on redactrations.com. We'll be right back with more after this. The second hour is coming up, and now that we've set the stage, we're going to get into some more details about the data itself, how it was taken, what it means, and the bigger picture, how it is tying into the overall hyperdimensional physics model that Richard has been talking about for many years now. Something is changing the laws of physics, and we'll speculate on what this is. We discuss the ideas of the fountain of youth, how the pyramid complexes was used to, among other things, supercharge seeds. The pyramids around the world simply amplifies the natural earth energies. He also shares his thoughts on the breakdown of the Triumph Carnival, the cruise ship that they were on when they went to the Yucatan. And a few weeks after this trip, the very same ship broke down. And Richard explains why he believed this was the case. Towards the end, he'll uh, drop a very interesting suggestion. We'll go back almost 2000 years and talk about the miscalculation of the calendar and what the 2012 end date really is, according to Richard. So, as usual, don't miss it for some interesting ideas. You can sign up for a subscription at RedEyesMembers.com if you're not already a member, and continue to listen to this and all of our programs going back to 2006 in their entirety. We have a wide variety of topics, and I'm sure that you'll find a lot that interests you, things you want to learn more about. A membership will also support an independent radio program that spares you from commercial interruptions, one dedicated to highlighting the topics that most won't even look at. Next on Red Eyes Radio, we have Dan Johnson with us to talk about the NDAA and the situation in the United States. After this, Greg Braden, Josh Reeves and Suzanne Posel. Stay with us in the members area as we'll proceed right now with Mr. Hoagland. is a rediscovered physics for about eight or nine years, ever since we made our first measurements of the Venus transit back at Coral Castle in 2004. And I was obviously beginning to empirically check the work that a lot of people had done vis-a-vis the Mayan calendar, the the predictions of the so-called end of the world. And we have been able to, with the assistance of Enterprise Mission Associates and uh, my Facebook friends and fans, of which there are legions, and I'm incredibly grateful to them, and to some private uh, sponsorship, we've been able to go to some very interesting places to ancient sacred sites all over the planet, Central America, Europe, etc., to measure the background torsion field changes uh, that were progressing in the model toward 2012, as well as the local amplification of the field that I, you know, basically had had laid out that these ancient sites might, in fact, create. And what we were doing, we sponsored people like NBC and, as I said, Enterprise Associates, is we went to Teotihuacan in uh, Mexico and to Tikal in Guatemala and to Stonehenge and Silbury Hill 
and Abury and some other places in England over the last few years, and we have measured, in addition to background measurements here in the United States, we've been measuring this the changes in this field with a device that I basically have adapted and digitized from my departed friend, Dr. Bruce De Palma, who first used it in the 1970s to measure this physics, except he didn't have any digital readouts. He didn't have laptop computers and apps and algorithms and, you know, the off-the-shelf stuff we have now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what I've done is I've digitized the system so that you can basically take it anywhere. It runs on batteries. And you're looking at the background changes that are occasioned by time of day, where the moon is, where the sun is. I mean, this is all dependent, as we found out empirically, on celestial alignments, which, of course, is what the theory said it would be. And so we've been going from sacred site to sacred site measuring the changes in this field because the torsion field is, is basically the old-fashioned classic ether that was supposedly abolished by the introduction of the theory of relativity by Einstein in the last century. Well, I can report that the ether is alive and well and doesn't know it's been abolished by anybody, <laughs> and we have been measuring it in these various places and getting rather extraordinary readings which affirm again and again and again that the field strength and the changes in the field are dependent on celestial configurations, celestial alignments. In other words, we're looking, Henrik, at hyperdimensional astrology, nothing more, nothing less. So when the occasion presented itself, that was a long lead-in to answer your question, when the occasion presented itself to go to the Yucatan, to Chichen Itza, which is kind of like the Mayan center for all the ancient Mayan calendrical and ritual and memorial and ceremonial materials. What did he die, God? He's nothing left. Ever since I was a child, I had a feeling of something missing. I want to know why I'm here. Can any of us know that? Become yourself. Then God and the devil don't matter. I want to learn. I want to understand. Be careful. Can you find the force to enable these two quite opposite lives to live together in your soul? At any moment, the wolf and you must learn what it means to become responsible. This is an exact science. And that is why you are here. returning or new listeners it doesn't matter it's good to have you with us whenever or wherever you're uh robin and i jumped to the chance and thereby as i used to say hangs a tail because it turned out that for a variety of reasons which i had described at some length on coast the other night um certain permits were not secured by the organizers of the trip on which i was invited unbeknownst to me so the night before we get to Chichen Itza on the ship, I mean, we're on a 100,000-ton cruise ship called the Carnival Triumph. Now, if that name rings a bell, it's because that's the same ship, identical, the same ship that's been stranded in the Gulf of Mexico over the last week, you know, when we, when we record this, and just got into port last night, again, as we record this, with 5,000, I'm sorry, 4,000, Passengers and crew, <clears throat> without facilities, without anything, huh. something happened in the engine room, and I will speak to that later, okay. because my measurements may, in fact, give a hint 
as to what could have happened with this cruise ship, which was, you know, weeks later, weeks after we had actually used her to go to and from the uh, Yucatan. Well, anyway, we're on the ship the night before we get to Gitsunitsa, which is December 18th. And we get a radiogram or a fax or a text or whatever they do on the high seas saying that under no circumstances will the authorities allow me to bring laptops, measuring equipment, the Accutron, backpacks, water, nothing into Chichen Itza. Well, wait a minute, back up. Who, who sent the, this message? This is from the authorities. You're listening from... My name is Henrik Palmgren from Sweden, and we have uh, two websites that I think you should check out if you want to hear more. RedEyesCreations.com and RedEyesMembers.com. Richard C. Hoagland is a former Museum Space Science Curator, a former NASA consultant, and was science advisor to Walter Cronkite and CBS News. In the early 1970s, Hoagland proposed to Carl Sagan, along with Eric Burgess, the placement of a message to mankind aboard Pioneer 10. Since then, he has been pioneering the pursuit of uncovering the hidden data of our solar system. He is the author of several books, probably most famous for his theories on the face on Mars. His website, enterprisemission.com, is updated regularly with analytical research into current anomalies on our planet and way beyond. Today, Richard is with us to discuss the trip he did to Chichen Itza in the Yucatan, where he did torsion measurement readings with the Accutron device at the Temple of Kukulkan, on December 21st, 2012. In the first hour, Hoagland will set the stage and give us the details about the experience, consequent arrest, and other strangeness. All right, welcome back to Red Ice Radio, Richard. Good to talk with you again. How are you? It's great to be back. I know you've been busy. Uh, a lot of things have been going on since we last talked, of course. I think one place where we need to begin is is around uh, your trip to uh, the pyramids down in uh, uh Mexico and, and, and the whole uh, torsion. Uh, uh, I know that you were, you were arrested as well. Take, take this from the top for us, Richard, so we can, we can understand what happened to you here. Well, I've been working on the torsion field hyperdimensional model of, of a new physics, which actually 